Hello, I'm Jesse Gray. Welcome to Books. A year ago on Books, well, this, the same uh, month, early June, we had Richard Bergen on. He had just come to New York from Boston and was attempting to launch, and did launch, the New York Arts Journal. We're having him back to ask him what's happened in a year, and a great deal has. Welcome, Richard. Thank you for being our guest again on Books. It's my pleasure. A lot has happened to the New York Arts Journal in a year. What? Well, we've uh, been lucky enough to have a very good critical and commercial response. We've gotten over 30 good reviews and publications ranging from Mademoiselle to Publishers Weekly, from The Village Voice to the Boston Globe. And you've managed to do this without placing an ad in any publication, haven't you? <laughs> we haven't paid for any ads. We've done a few exchange ads. And uh, also, I should say that now uh, we've signed a contract uh, with an international distributor, Euro Journals. And our current issue, which I guess you just showed, uh, the copies that were distributed in Canada sold out in two and a half weeks. And uh, this issue will be uh, on sale in the West Coast and better bookstores and galleries uh, throughout the country, in addition to New York. Yeah, all boroughs of New York. Now, a year ago, it was just distributed in New York and Boston. Yeah, you'd you'd, yeah. In one year, you've gone to uh, n not only national distribution, but international. Yeah, we have some copies in Paris. Um, What's in this issue? Well, they can see it, I, I believe. Uh, there's, there's an interview with Jack Nicholson, which uh, has been much discussed. Uh, I believe uh, it was on the editorial page of the Boston Globe under the Literary Life column, uh, piece. It's a rather revealing interview in his uh, intellectual and philosophical approach to life and acting, isn't it? I don't think people expected that from Jack Nicholson. I, I guess, or maybe they didn't expect that a magazine would, would treat him as a person who has something serious to say, because this is a serious magazine, really. Not who he's dating this, this month, or you go <laughs> exactly. for a change. Exactly. And I think that was a refreshing approach and made for something that was interesting, you know, something out of the uh, usual. I've never been interested in the usual, frankly. Now, Saul yeah. Bellows to Jerusalem and back. This His book is reviewed. Yes. Uh, this has been... Um, and the reviewer is... Noam Chomsky. Uh, and he says he is, Saul, speaking of Saul Bellow, he has produced a catalog of what every good American should believe as compiled by the Israeli Information Ministry. <laughs> and he attacks to Jerusalem and back. It's a brilliant piece of sarcastic wit, I'll say, without taking any stance on the ideological content of the piece. Uh, it's upset people. It's been the most uh, controversial piece to date, I guess with the possible exception of uh, Douglas Davis's essay on art politics in our first issue. Uh, it's been discussed in Boston Globe, Boston Herald, I guess all uh, papers in Boston because Chomsky's a professor at MIT, as many people realize, a very famous linguist as well as a political commentator. Any response from Bella? No, uh, but uh, it's also been written up uh, two weeks ago, I guess, in The Voice by Andrew Coburn in press clips. And uh, there has been a response from the President of the American Jewish Committee, and they are going to be, uh, they have uh, selected uh, David Schoenbrunn, who's a well-known uh, journalist, he used to be a newscaster on CBS, is author of a number of books, and he's going to write a rebuttal to Chomsky's attack on uh, Bella. Did you have any hesitation about publishing? Of course. Book no, Did absolutely you enjoy it? Not. Were you glad to do it? Yeah, it was a brilliant piece of writing, uh, as writing, uh, regardless of how one feels uh, about the issue. I think that it's uh, it's lucid, it's sarcastic, uh, without, uh, but it's without being insubstantial. How's the magazine expanded now? You also have movie reviews. We have movie reviews in this issue for the first time, and. That, along with Nicholson interview, gives us uh, a kind of movie section. We also have jazz uh, 
for reviews or articles um, before we had written about only uh, so-called classical music. I guess that's a catch-all term that people still basically understand what that means. Uh, so we are trying to deal with, with more arts. Um, and we're planning to continue our coverage with theater and get into dance, in addition to our regular features, music reviews, art reviews, book reviews, fiction, poetry, and photography. How do you feel? It's a very Wagnerian product. <laughs> How do you uh, feel kind of magazine, that's after your publication? How's it affected your life? How has it changed your life? Well, I'm kind of a prisoner of the whole thing in a, in, in a certain sense. Uh, obviously, I elected to do it, so in that sense, I don't, it's not a punishment, but uh, I can't go and away. And yet it is. <laughs> well, I can't go uh, away. I always have to be there. Um, you know, there are places I'd like to go. Can you turn the magazine off now, or is, or is it your totally your life? Or even if you're doing something else, uh, involved in something else, is one corner of your mind thinking, Oh my God! I've got to do this and this and this and this and this and this. I think that uh, it's very difficult to give one self. Um, you know, we lose this. We use this word uh, obsession rather loosely. Um, I think it's very difficult to give oneself over to a single obsession so completely that everything else in your life disappears. In other words, you haven't. I suppose that's one definition of madness. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. No, I'm, I'm involved in other projects. Such as? Well, I'm uh, just about ready to uh, say that uh, a book uh, of interviews I've been working on with Isaac Bashir, a singer, is near its completion. Um, and be sending that out. I'm working on my own fiction. And I'm also uh, teaching uh, at Columbia, and I'm in the doctoral program there, there too. So. Uh, In other words, you're very busy. What about Singer? Could, what, what kind of a man is he? Well, he's uh, it might be interesting to compare him. I guess you, you know that I did a book of interviews that was uh, published uh, years ago with uh, Jorge Luis Borges, or Borges would be the American pronunciation of it. And they make a kind of an interesting contrast. They're both very great writers, older men. But uh, yeah, and this, and they're uh, they're both intellectuals. Intellectuals of a very different kind. Borges, you might say, although his writing always comes from life, and I think of him, you know, as a man of genius. Um, there's a real sense in which he bases his literature and literature itself. Um, where a singer's trying to, in effect, return literature to life, which is, I suppose, why Henry Miller is one of his great champions. That's always been one of uh, Miller's desires. What is he like personally, uh, aside from his writing, as a man? He's, uh, he's very warm, he's very direct, he's temperamental. He's, in, he's in very way? human, as they used to say. I don't know how applicable that is always, but <laughs> some people. But uh, in what way is, is he what? Temperamental. Can you well, he'll tell you just example? what he thinks without, you know, um, worrying about the niceties necessarily of, of human conduct. Whether you like <laughs> it or not. Yeah, he's, uh, he's tremendously honest, which is a quality I really respect. And he's gotten angry at me, and he's told me so, and he's told me why, and he's... Does he keep an anger? Pardon me? Does he keep his anger, or does no, he get over it? No, I would say it's more of a, when that should happen, uh, which doesn't happen frequently by any means, but uh, it's a kind of a quick thing. What have you gotten from knowing him? Well, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish, uh, you know, I'll have the experience of knowing him from reading him, but what I call from reading him, and it's uh, interesting to see the interrelationship between the two. I mean, it's quite an experience to re be reading a great book like The Family Moscat, or The, the Manor of the Estate, great early novels, uh, and then, you know, go over there and work on a book dealing with his thoughts 
on literature and life in general. Uh, He's approaching. I've gotten uh, well. I've gotten uh, a different view of uh, of literature, which is much against uh, the mainstream, or at least the academic mainstream. Uh, I've gotten a sense of the importance of. Uh, I hate to use an over over used word, but one's roots, which is very important to him. The importance of uh, writing about what you know about, which is why he writes in Yiddish, although he, he could write in other languages, because that was the, that's the language he knows best, which is why he writes about the Poland of his childhood very often, because that's especially vivid in his memory. Uh, and um, there's a great deal of validity, you know, in what he says. And he feels that uh, much of modern literature has become too solipsistic, too narcissistic, uh, where writers are constantly brooding about themselves and dramatizing their little thoughts. He's kind of against the stream of consciousness technique where uh, much is made of whatever thoughts flow through someone's mind. I guess he feels that the bitter truth is that one is known by what one does and not by what one, th one thinks. That, that what one does, in other words, reveals the the real characteristics of a person. He talks about death a lot in his stories, uh, and he's an older man. Has he talked to you about uh, his ideas about his own death? Yes, he has. The, uh, he's one of the parts of his honesty that I most appreciate is his intellectual honesty, and uh, he doesn't shy away from anything. Uh, yes, he thinks about death. He thinks about... Uh, what does he think about it? He, well, it's going to be, you know, I, 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 we have... Um, Maybe 20 pages on that, and uh, I, I, I somewhat uh, would feel uh, that I might be doing him a disservice to try to sum up thoughts that are, well, I feel profound <laughs> and uh, certainly well thought out. Uh, he does have, uh, after all, a great mind, <laughs> and uh, but it's but it's nothing that uh, he. It's a great mind, and it's a it, it's a mind that's always informed by passion, by emotional commitment, by ins emotional insights. That's the whole, uh, and by a real grasp of man's psychological situation. It's not a great mind in the sense that Kant necessarily is a great mind, or it's not a, a difficult philosophical jargon. Let me understand. ask you this: sure. uh, all in his all of his stories, he keeps questioning. He doesn't really find any answers. He just keeps questioning. Has he found any answers? Not that you have to say what they are, but or is he still questioning, even in his old age, the reason for? He's things. still questioning. I don't <laughs> feel that uh, he feels he'll ever find uh, ultimate. He's realized that he won't. <laughs> truth. Yes, he feels that. Uh, well, I think in one section I can say this: that he compares the universe to an infinite book of which he's read only two or three pages. And he says, of these two or three pages that I've read, uh, you might say, that I don't like the language. The grammar seems clumsy. It seems cruel. Uh, he believes in a God, but he's not necessarily certain that this God is merciful. A God may be cruel. Uh, it, from what he knows of this infinite book, these two or three pages, the God does seem cruel merciless, clumsy, uncaring. But he feels uh, that it's like uh, his relationship to this God is like a little child just learning to speak. Does he to, resent to the fact parents, that, that he's only been allowed to read two or three pages? He doesn't presume. He has, a, he, has a, he has a real oh. humility. And I guess he feels that while he can't praise it at this point, and he won't praise it, and he will say what he perceives at this point, the cruelty, you know, but uh, everything that exists lives off something else, someone else's death, so something else's death. And uh, he has <laughs> repeatedly dramatized uh, instances of uh, real cruelty in terms of man's behavior to man. Uh, he uh, says, well, at this point I shouldn't praise it. But he, he feels that it's, he knows just a tiny bit. It's like a tiny island in the ocean of knowledge. That's, that's what he knows. Now, you've written this book during the year that you put out the, the New York Arts Journal. Mm -hmm. and, if you, and you're writing fiction. Yeah. Are you basically a writer at heart? Is that what, what would you 
describe yourself as a publisher or no, a writer? No, I'm a writer. I'm a writer and Has I... Has the magazine cut into your writing? Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Does it sometimes seem like an albatross that yeah. you... Yeah. <laughs> Do you think as the magazine grows larger, you're if, going to if Singer have more freedom? If Singer doesn't lie about death, <laughs> I'm not going to lie about something like this. <laughs> what do you see ahead for yourself as a writer as the magazine grows, as indeed it is? Do you hope to, to gain freedom through the magazine? Jesse, I just don't know how to answer that question. I'm joining, and right now I'm just doing uh, as many of the... Uh, the things that I, I can't conceive of myself not writing and at this point I can't conceive of myself not doing a magazine and uh, a lot of writers, Bullcase as a matter of fact was editor of a magazine, so was T.S. Eliot. Uh, not trying to draw any analogies by any stretch of imagination, simply saying it. Even Singer was involved in a magazine for a year and a half. Of course, you have been totally in charge of the New York Arts Journal. You've uh, Well, I have you've a co-editor, Holland Carter. Yeah. At this point, I began it. I was founding editor. You were founding editor. You've literally had to be involved in every facet of it: the business, the uh, yeah. sales, right, the publishing. Tell us about your childhood. Uh, <laughs> to change the subject, because your father was the concert master for the Boston Symphony, and you grew up in a very artistic family. Mm -hmm. I know it's an abrupt. Everybody's laughing at such an abrupt change of pace, but. You came from an artistic family. Yes, I did. Uh, musical family. My parents were both uh, child prodigy violinists, and my father was also an excellent conductor and scholar of music, in addition to being a concert master of Boston Symphony. Yeah. And uh, naturally, it was kind of overwhelming. And people like uh, Heifetz and Horowitz and Stravinsky and Schoenberg were their friends, and in the myth, I guess, wrote one of his uh, symphonies. Um, uh, I think the one in uh, E flat in our house. And Stravinsky used to interrupt his, my father's dates with my mother when he was courting her to go over Boeing's and things of that nature. He lived with Prokofiev. He was very good friends with Sibelius, my father. Uh, because, uh, he's Polish, and he uh, was in Scandinavia for a while before he came to. Uh, uh, this country, and uh, he gave the first performance, I guess, of Sibelius' violin concerto, and there were always pupils over. My, both my parents taught in our houses, and uh, How naturally was, what was the life for you growing up in this household? Well, um, like most things in life, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> in what way? In, in what way it was a, it was a blessing uh, in that I was able to constantly hear great music, which made me able to appreciate it, whereas most people, while they're compelled to learn English, don't learn the language of music, and so they, it's very difficult for them. My goodness, I was hearing this all the time, and it still took me 13 years before I could understand Mozart of Beethoven, even on an emotional level. <laughs> so uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, people take music appreciation courses in school, and then it, that's like, you know, Sending someone to the guillotine, that's the end. I mean, once, they, <laughs> once it's mixed in with getting good marks, you can forget it. I mean, you'll never. Were you involved in your that. parents' careers? Emotionally? Listening <laughs> to uh, my mother, uh, especially, yeah. yeah. She'd get very nervous. It's a terrifying thing to, to play a violin concerto uh, by memory in front of thousands of people, and if you make one slip, you know. So she was very nervous beforehand, and yeah. you you empathized with her. My father had a very uh, well. I was you know I was scared for her. Sure, she'd get very frightened. Did you play a musical instrument? I did, but I made the mistake of studying with my parents, and perhaps it was impossible anyway. You know, so I play stuff on my own now. I do you? Uh, what but what I'm instrument? Strictly an amateur piano. Yeah. Do you love music more than any other art form, or? Yes, I do. Then why did you change to writing? Well, I suppose it has to do with my parents. I suppose that's a very... When you write, do our words, in effect, I mean, they are sound, are they music? Do you, do you find yourself composing, in a way, musically? Well, a conventional uh, wisdom would say that that's more true of poets 
you know, and... Uh, Conventional wood, but do you? Well, there's something to that, because you have to have a special intensity uh, and a special concentration on words if you're writing lyric poetry, especially since people aren't writing epic poems anymore as Homer and Dante or even lesser poets did. You know. Now, so that means that it's really a very intense concentration on each word and its sound value, which you don't find in prose where large sections are strictly functional. Uh, but I think it's probably helped me. I, I think I pay attention to that, yeah. But, you know, if I had to sum up very quickly, uh, I'd say that uh, the poetry of fiction really comes uh, from situations, whereas the, the power of poetry uh, comes from the images uh, of language, which of course embodies the sound reinforcing the sense of the words. And some would even say the visual element. But in fiction, it's essentially the situations. Uh, that's what distinguishes the narrative uh, prose from poetry of our time, very, very generally, I would say. Do you love words? Do you, do you, like to, do you love to write? If it's, uh, if it's good. Yeah, you know. <laughs> if it's going well. <laughs> yeah. I guess that sums it up. Uh, if you were told you had one year to do exactly what you wanted, <laughs> what would you do? Yeah. And you had to do just exactly what you wanted. They had a TV series like that once, didn't they, where the guy had only had one year to live and he ran around you had a year traveling to live. everywhere. You had a year to live. I'd travel everywhere, but I'm afraid I'd keep seeing America because it's, it seems to be spreading all over the globe. You would be. You <laughs> but, would be. Uh, so I don't, I'm not really a great uh, interest in traveling. Um, I've spent so much of my time in thinking about my past and maybe brooding about my past and being too self-indulgent about it that I'd probably resist the temptation to go back and visit old loves <laughs> or old friends. Um, I suppose I'd go to uh, some place that's close to my uh, heart, like uh, the Tanglewood, because I guess the Boston Symphony was there every summer, and maybe uh, like uh, Sylvia Plath in her last days when, uh, when she decided to, to end her life. Uh, I suppose I'd really try to write a lot and try to undo whatever harm or damage I've done to people, not in the hopes of, uh, of achieving an afterlife in the right place, you know. <laughs> One doesn't want to go apartment hunting after that. <laughs> but uh, that's what I suppose I'd do. Do you feel that you've done damage to people? Do you find... Of course. How can, you can't live without that happening. Does it does it bother you still sure. that you've done it years ago to people? Sure. Do you find a, a lot of people wanting favors from you, do you and uh, perhaps finding it hard to approach people honestly or have people approach you honestly now that you are publishing the New York Arts Journal? Yeah. Well, when I used to teach, uh, I, I taught at Tufts for four years. In fact, even before that, whenever you're in a position to do anything for someone, you know this yourself, I'm sure. Naturally, that happens. Does it bother you? Do you do you suspect everyone more than you did? Well, at this point, I find I just um, just kind of take it for granted. At this point, I find it's, it's, do you try it's to sad. Separate it? It's sad. It's a symptom of our culture, and one can relate it to capitalism and the whole <laughs> way that, that or affects human people. Nature, psych perhaps. Well, the uh, whole way that affects people <laughs> psychologically. I mean, one could approach it from any you know different angles. It's sad. Uh, it's unfortunate, but, you Does know. it bother you? Yeah, it bothers me, sure. Let's give the magazine <laughs> another plug. We're just about to close. Where is it again? It's in New York since... Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's uh, we're practically sold out, but there are still uh, copies available. Uh, depends what area of town, I guess. Uh, in Soho, you could get it in... New Morning Bookstore, or Yap Reitman's Bookstore, or Soho Books. Uh, Reitman sold, sells hundreds of copies, doesn't he? I guess he sold almost 500 one time. Um, in Midtown, you get at Gotham Bookmart, Rizzoli's, 
More in bookstores than on newsstands. Oh, yeah, more in bookstores and newsstands and galleries, like Whitkin Gallery, Hotel Algonquin. We have it in some hotels, Empire Hotel. Uh, we sell well on Papyrus around Columbia, the New Yorker bookstore, Big Apple. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, we're, we're in a lot of You're in a lot of places. It's not on newsstands because it's on distribution some. It's is... On some. And a headache, is it not? <laughs> I don't distribute it, uh, but uh, finding a distribu finding distributors who distribute. Yeah, it's a problem. Sure. It's a headache. Sure. When is the next issue coming out? Uh, next issue will be out in uh, September, and then we'll be going by monthly, and it'll be out at the very beginning of September. And you'll see part two of that Jack Nicholson interview that people have been talking about in the rebuttal to the Chomsky piece, and uh, story by Isaac Singer and our usual features. We'll have an essay by Elliot Carter, who you very renowned and deservedly so composer. Uh, if people want surprises. to contribute to the magazine, do you welcome uh, manuscripts with a return? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I know we have an all-star lineup here, but uh, the this piece of fiction we published was the first uh, work that the writer had written, and he's only 22, and it's a brilliant piece of writing. And I was happy to do it. Where so. can people reach you? Uh, by phone. Well, or address, <laughs> perhaps. 560 Riverside Drive, 10027, in, in our wonderful city. <laughs> would you suggest, if people would like to contribute to the magazine, that they send an, a letter uh, describing their article first before sending the article? No, oh, that's not necessary. No, just send no. it with a return sure. envelope. Sure, self-addressed stamped envelope, yeah. Thank you for being on Books today. We've been talking to Richard Bergen, editor of the New York Arts Journal and writer. I'm Jesse Gray. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs>